Well, good afternoon. Um, welcome to NCG Studios, Texas. Once again, we're glad to be here, and I'm especially glad to have this, uh, if you want to call her a guest, or you can call her a regular on the show. She's kind of a little of both. But for me, she's my favorite person in the world. So, um, and you know, Dr. Jones probably coming in second. I'm going to miss him today because uh, he's not going to be able to be on the show. But uh, we uh, are looking forward to spending some time with you. How about you? Am I speaking for you? Yeah. All right. I thought today what we might do is just uh, give a little dose of what we enjoy uh, every chance we get, which. It's not as often as we'd like with our busy schedules, but every opportunity we get, we just like to talk, communicate. And uh, here at NCG, that's kind of the name of the game. I mean, uh, communication's everything. And uh, so we just want to uh, enjoy a little of that this afternoon and see if we can keep it going for a while. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> think we can do that? I'm sure you can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> Not by myself. <laughs> uh, but so I won't put you on the spot. I want to ask you to say something. I'll uh, ask you a question first. Um, what do you think about babies? About babies, like <laughs> <laughs> just in general. <laughs> what a question, huh? Yeah. Oh, do you like them? I love babies. Okay. They're very cute, uh, just awesome little human beings. <laughs> okay. So they, you enjoy them, would that be correct? Sure. Enjoy what? To elaborate just a little bit. Yeah, I enjoy holding them and uh, just... Um, well, there's a form of communication with babies. You just look into their eyes and, and just watch um, as you talk to them, their expressions change as they watch you. And um, I enjoy that. I enjoy um, holding, cuddling, just meeting their needs, as it were. You know, whatever they need, just tending to them. It's a joy, it's a blessing. You speak as one with uh, some experience. Am I correct? <laughs> I got a little bit. As if I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I've, I've watched you for years now, and it doesn't seem to matter if it's your own or your grandchild, uh, just babies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you get an opportunity to hold one or uh, a, a new one that we've gone to see, uh, it always puts a smile on your face. It does. And um, I think that's that's really important coming from you because of all your experience. You know, it's not like you've just done it once or twice. <laughs> you've done it for the better part of your life. But I have a, a particular reason for asking that question because I was thinking of a little bit different perspective. And by the way, this is not uh, what I think of babies, but I want to see if we can do something hypothetical here, just just for the fun of it and just for the sake of hopefully making a, an interesting point. If, and, and I won't use you, that would be too difficult. You'd have to go back and erase tons of wonderful memory uh, memories, which would be quite impossible. But let's just uh, say that uh, you, you, you could find a person that had never seen a baby. And I'm talking about a, a big person, not a little person, that it wouldn't uh, make much difference. But uh, if it were possible, let's just say we find someone uh, of a significant age that has never been around a baby and you didn't have anyone to even tell them what it was. <laughs> and uh, whether the baby was in a uh, crib or, or you placed it in their arms or, or whatever you did. 
I'm curious as to what would be their experience, how they would describe it. Would their description be the same as yours? And uh, I'll ask you what you, your thoughts on that, first of all. Then I'll give you mine. No, probably not. <laughs> Good answer, in my opinion. <laughs> if, if they didn't know how to hold the baby, how to cuddle it up and make it feel secure, the baby would possibly cry. And, uh, you know, if you didn't know what the crying was about, uh, it could get to you how much they cry. <laughs> and possibly frustrate you and make the situation worse. You know, I'm so glad you're on the show today, or on the show with me, because um, <laughs> I'll tell you, I thought about asking Dr. Jones this question, had he been on the show, <laughs> and uh, that would have been okay, but I don't think I would have got the same perspective, and he's the one, and I'm going to tell on him here, he's the one that's always encouraging me and telling me and telling He's not quiet about this. It's not like he just tells me or certain people. He, he likes to let this no, be known that uh, in his estimation, women are every bit as important as, man, as men and significant as men. And really, I think he even goes farther than that and kind of elevates them above men. And I'm okay with that myself. Uh, I, I used to believe the Bible. <laughs> Uh, the way it has been uh, translated and used uh, for a number of years toward a lot of people, that man is the head. And uh, if you go back into the Old Testament and you believe the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, then you've got to put women in another category. And that is kind of like, um, you know, a possession or uh, possibly a, uh, or, or worse. <laughs> Uh, not treated with the kind of respect they deserve, not given the, uh, hmm, this, the stage that they need, I don't know how to put it, uh, just the importance, the significance of uh, the, the input, the uh, participation in life itself. Um, I find myself not really knowing how to say it. But the things that you've just shared with me, I'll just get to the point, uh, to me are extremely significant, extremely important. And they, they're things that uh, I can relate to only up to a point, uh, you know, as a man. I, I, <laughs> I'm going to get to my point, but first okay. of all, <laughs> let me say, I love babies too. I enjoy them. Uh, I, I've experienced a lot of what you stated about them, but not near to the degree that you have. And, uh, you know, I think that what you've said should be considered extremely valuable because uh, it's, it's what a mother feels toward her children. It's, it's what a woman feels uh, legitimately and rightfully toward, uh, toward babies, toward infants. But I have a particular reason for bringing this up because I want to get back to the other scenario where you've got someone who has never seen one, doesn't necessarily even know what it is, and they have it placed in their arms. You're right. I think you're absolutely right. They wouldn't know what to do or how to deal with it, especially if they didn't even know for sure what it was. But what would they discover would be my question. And here's my thought. Here's a little creature that is extremely demanding and it's noisy and it would be quite possibly after just a little while, very irritating. And uh, you would probably be looking if you didn't have someone to refer to and say, what do I do with this? What is it? you would probably be looking for some alternative as to what to do with it. And uh, the end results might not be that good. <laughs> uh, you might just find yourself wanting to get rid of it somehow or another. 
because it would be such a nuisance. If someone didn't let you know what it, what it is, there may be a serious problem there, serious results. So what's my point? Well, I was trying to think of a good analogy of, um, of hmm, how do I say it? I, I'm going to go ahead and just be kind of blunt with it. Uh, what we've kind of come face to face with. And uh, it has to do with, with what we've been talking about uh, recently at the New Covenant Group. And we've been talking about community. We've been talking about uh, the larger picture, uh, which most of Christendom, and, I, and I'm just going to point my finger and be specific. I think most of Christendom is not familiar with this. And I'm, I'm going to use this, um, this infant, this idea of, of infancy, babies, um, metaphorically. And uh, Dr. Jones was teaching this morning, and he was dealing with uh, some of the way that Jesus taught. And one of the things that he stated was that, you know, he said, I am the light. And he talked about the light shining in darkness. Well, he wasn't talking about a physical light or a literal light. He was using this as metaphor so that people could see, uh, so that we could see the connection, you know, the, that light represented good, you know, something wonderful, and the darkness represented something that, that needed the light. Well, in the same sense, I wanted to use this idea of infancy. Uh, uh, Paul is actually one that used that kind of terminology, he actually used this terminology, and he referred to people uh, as infants in a certain sense. And back, and I'll get real specific now, back when we uh, were in the bondages of uh, teaching, biblical teaching, certain biblical teaching, um, and, and see if you identify with this. I didn't look at people, well, to get real specific, such as atheists, non-believers, and even those who we didn't think believed the right thing, and they believed in God or gods, but not the right one. Uh, well, I'll just ask the question, did, did we look at them possibly as infants? Or Back then, no. We, we looked at them, how? I mean, I'm going to have to grasp here a little bit. Basically, we were taught to look at them as not part of the picture. <laughs> Outcasts, mm -hmm. reprobates, uh, heathen. Yeah. Uh, just throw some terms out there. I, I guess that would be the best way to put it, and, and maybe most people could identify with those terms to know where we're coming from. But how should they be viewed? Now, if you put these two ideas together, you put someone who's trying to come to terms with something, such as a child that's just been placed in their arm and they don't even know what it is, compared to someone like you who know exactly what you're holding and you know exactly how to deal with it. And you understand, and... and <laughs> Let me get you on record here. Uh, the things that, that I've, or the way that I've described an infant, would you agree that those things are also true? Yes, it's cute. Yes, they're cute. Yes, they're wonderful. Yes, they're all these things. But aren't they completely self-seeking and dependent and know nothing, can do nothing for themselves? Uh, uh, at times, just, you, you know, you don't know what they need. They can't even communicate with you what they need, what they want. So they cry and they do these irritating things <laughs> and they require so much attention. And, so, you know, the list goes on. Are these things not true also? Yes, I, I would say they are. I, I don't know. My viewpoint has changed somewhat. I used to think infants were... Um, very selfish, self-seeking. But I think 
more of them now as just not understanding. Mm. There's just a crying out because they don't know what to do. They don't know how to communicate to us. You know, there's, there's babies that are in pain but don't know how to let you know, hey, I'm hurting and where it's hurting. Mm. And so it, it's more or less a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge. Hmm. And, you know, the cry was given to them as a way of communicating. And maybe just a cry for help. It, it may even be supposed to be a little bit irritating, huh? Where you'll, they'll get your attention. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> you know, and you'll want to satisfy the need to where they'll stop crying. Right. Um, well, it, it almost sounds like we rehearsed this, but we didn't. Honestly, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you have played right into this thing. I mean, to, into my thoughts. I mean, the thought pattern on this, because I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think anyone that couldn't agree with what you're saying would probably need a little mental help, a little, you know, uh, attention in that department. Because, you know, if we look at babies any other way, I don't think we, we might not be ready for the... Um, the experience of child care, you know, because uh, I think these things are very necessary in dealing with an infant properly. Uh, I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of it, you know, that uh, this is the most needful time in a human being's life. I mean, this is the formative time. And uh, without, and let's just call it love, what do you say? I mean. I guess the name of our show is still What Would Love Do? <laughs> so it's okay to go there from time to time, at least. But uh, everything that you've expressed to me about it just sounds like that how love is defined. And I think we can even go to the writings of Paul there. I, I think if there's anything that has major significance, that would be one thing, is, is the way Paul describes this thing called love. And it takes someone who understands a little about those qualities <clears throat> to provide it for this infant so that the, 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 the child can develop properly. And, um, you know, it's, be, it's being communicated from you. You've already talked about what's communicated from the baby, and that's something that I think only one who has been there and experienced, such as yourself, can understand and describe and the reciprocation on your part is something that you have to fulfill that need and it i think it does it has more to do with what's being expressed toward the child than it does even meeting the need because you are facilitating but you're facilitating you know whether it be hunger whether it be a wet diaper, <laughs> whatever it is, whether it's a need for sleep and it's just a, an assuring that going into this thing called sleep is okay, you know, give in to it. Um, it's coming from an attitude of, I want to do for you. I want you to develop. I want you to uh, receive this uh, wonderful expression that's in me for you. And I'm saying all this because I think it's, <laughs> I don't know which one is more important. I think they're equally as important, the development of children. I mean, if, if we can develop a generation that knows nothing but love, what would we have? You know, if we could have everyone, every child that's born, being given that kind of expression, that kind of care. In a few years, how much difference would that make? But let's place it in another category. Let's go back to these heathens, these uh, reprobates, these outcasts. Uh, and that, I don't know, in some senses, I, I really think that we were taught to treat them as, e as if they're even not even human. Because if you get too attached in any way, and I've been asked this question before, and a lot of people have, and I think a lot more need to be asked. Could you be happy 
if one of your family members, one of your loved ones, uh, were burning in eternity and you were in the bliss of heaven? And I think the only honest answer to that would, question would be no. You know, how could you? How could you be okay with that? Of course, we know that that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, that uh, that's not even part of the equation. But, you know, if you're like us, and, and this is kind of where I want to go with this, because we used to think that way. You know, uh, I'm sure that we had plenty of family members that we just didn't know. I don't know if they're in heaven or if they're in hell. And we were taught that. We believed that. Uh, I don't think we ever really tried to deal with it. We just probably must have just shoved it out of our minds or, or never really even thought about it. I don't know. But um, the question should be, what do we do with all these people now? How do we view them? And then when I say these people, I'm talking about people that uh, that always come up whenever you whenever you talk about these things. They say, "Well, what about so and so?" And usually, the most common one, Adolf Hitler. You know, yeah. you mean he's well, in heaven? <laughs> we view them as people that have needs. That. You know, they don't have the understanding that we have. They hmm. don't have the knowledge, and they have need of us sharing such things with them. Uh, in a, just like dealing with infants, you deal with them with a gentleness, a tenderness of understanding they don't know. Hmm. You know, even what's what's written in our scriptures, uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, they don't know what they're doing to me. Mm -hmm. And there was a gentleness of uh, wanting to help them because they don't know. Right. And so I think that's the same view that we should have about people is just that desire of, if I understand something, you don't understand let me share it with you you know let yeah. me help you with that need well you mentioned Jesus he also made reference at one time when someone wanted to make an accusation against supposed sinners as if there was anyone you know one day Jesus asked that you who was that without sin cast the first stone and at least apparently they had enough on the ball to realize you know what I can't throw one. Yeah. <laughs> but the way he addressed the issue of sinners, he said, it's the sick that need a physician. You know, so you've got problems. You need attention. You need uh, special attention. You need uh, the right kind of attention to deal with the problem. And uh, I can't think, and, and to me, when Paul used this kind of terminology, when he referred to, and, it, and at first, I remember reading in, it's actually, you find it in the book of Corinthians, where he, he talks about a group of people as being mere infants. I thought he was making fun of them. I thought he was just saying, you know, you, you're such babies. <laughs> and maybe he was, because he was that kind of guy. You know, I mean, who wants to be called a baby? You're just a big baby. <laughs> but it depends on how you look at babies. If you have the viewpoint that you've expressed toward babies, what a wonderful thing to say, you know? You're sweet, you're precious, uh, you have needs, but we're gonna see that you get those needs taken care of. And he does actually go on to say that. He says, you need milk. You know, I've got to get you on the milk. I've got to get you what you need, and we'll see to it. And he gave, made that same expression to the Galatians when he said, let the ones that have some maturity about them uh, deal with the one, or uh, how does he say it? Um, you are spiritual. Restore. Uh, he talked about restoration of those who are trapped in sinfulness. And it's, it's a very sweet, it's a very loving thing. 
but it's done by people who have some maturity in this in this area that know something about how to look at someone in a situation like that. Because if we're still looking through eyes of condemnation, I'm holding this baby and I'm saying, you sorry thing, all you can do is make noise. You're just an irritation to me. You're, you're, let me cast you out. <laughs> and in my estimation, this is, a, this is a good comparison. If we can look at people as people like you're saying to me, people that just maybe don't understand, maybe they've never been acquainted, maybe no one's ever taken time because they really don't care about them. They're just sorry. They're just sorry people and don't deserve my attention. And then I think about what Jesus taught. He taught, love your enemies. And it's like, okay, I don't think of that anymore as, oh, wow, what are you asking me to do? Well, okay, I mean, if, if that's what I got to do to follow you, then I'm going to try to do it. We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about a whole different attitude, a whole different viewpoint. We're looking at people, you know, through eyes of caring. You know, I see you've got problems. I see you're hurting. You have to be to lash out and to have that kind of issues. And I want to get find a way to get healing to you. I want to get you what you need. I care about you. To me, that's that's powerful. It is. It really is. You know, and another thing that crossed my mind is, you know, in the scripture where it says that Jesus will supply all your needs. And I used to think, you know, if I was real good and I prayed about these needs that poof they'd be taken care of <laughs> and it was some magic sort Jesus. of yeah magical <laughs> thing maybe he's up there with a little wand and you know shook it at me or something but uh, it's not it's a matter of us reaching out to each other that's where the needs are met is in humanity there's mm -hmm. and you know with Jesus being in us, it's Him motivating us to um, minister to the needs that we see. Yeah. It's, it's that character of compassion and caring and gentleness that you, you look at folks and you just can't help yourself. You just want to be there helping doing all you can yeah it's a it's a whole different ball game isn't it and by the same token you know um i'm not perfectly healthy myself and i look to folks there's a there's a thing of treating them as i would want to be treated yeah. there's a time that you know hey i, I need your help too and that's with everybody. I, I feel like that every person is, you know, that we're connected one to another. Every person is just as important as the next. And we need each other, regardless. Well, to, if, we, if we take this teaching tool, uh, is, and I'm just kind of throwing this out there, you know, when I look at the writings of the Apostle Paul now, I look at it completely different than I used to. And I've, Dr. Jones and I have talked back and forth about this, and I'm very thankful for uh, getting the rose-colored glasses off, you know, the way I used to look at the Bible. And uh, I look at the writings of Paul and, and I see a man who was struggling to communicate something. I mean, he was, I feel like he was using every tool in his arsenal just to try to explain what this concept, this, this uh, new way of thinking that he had discovered. And I, I'm sure at times he struggled and I'm sure that he wasn't fully matured in it. He admitted that. You, you can find places where he admitted it. I haven't arrived. I'm not there yeah. yet, but I press forward. And, um, but he, he did use the analogy of 
infancy uh, through maturity. I mean that there's a there's a maturing process in uh, this attitude, this this reality that we're talking about. But there's also uh, he used the analogy of the human body, and that's something that we're also familiar with. I mean, when I see someone walking around uh, with a prosthetic leg or Maybe they're in a wheelchair because they don't have any legs. Or I see someone with a, a nub here or, or any missing part of their body. You know, my heart goes out to them. You know, I can't imagine. I, I don't want to be without any part of my body. It, it, it all works together so well. It's so beautifully designed. And, uh, you know, to think of just saying, you know, I don't, I don't like this finger. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm just going to do away with it. No one would even think that way. You'd you'd be, you'd need to go in the state hospital we saw last night, <laughs> get some treatment. But um, if if we look at one another that way, you know, at the same time, when when you look at that infant child that you're holding, you know, it's it's almost like a gift. It's like, okay, what will this child become? He, he he or she is going to have something valuable to contribute to humanity. And if this child can be nurtured and, uh, you know, matured in such a way that they will have this attitude of compassion and con contributing what they have to contribute, who knows what we'll get. And... Uh, so if, if we begin to look at one another that way, that this person, although maybe right now it seems like they have nothing to contribute, all they can do is whine and cry and cause people pain. Uh, what if they were nurtured? What if someone took the time, showed the patience and the kindness to, uh, to help them with their ailment? to the point to where they could make their contribution, we would all benefit. And this is the, when we talk about community, which is, you know, what we've been talking about, to me, this is the sense that we need to have. And let me interject something there too. Sure. With, you know, with each child, it was a different um, challenge, maybe. I should, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but you know, of figuring out how to uh, communicate with them, how to meet their needs. They all had different needs. And it's the same with people. Sometimes we get in a rut of thinking, oh, this will work with every person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. It doesn't. Every person is different, and every person has different things to contribute. And we need to respect who that person is you know um, tap into who they are right and be respectful in the communication that we have with them and and find a way to encourage that person to come along yeah I don't know how else to say it, but you, <laughs> you know forward, what I'm saying. Forward, yeah, yeah, move forward. Like Paul said, yeah. press onward, you know. Right. That's, that's the whole idea. Uh, but not try to change the person that they no, are. No. You know, uh, and in a church setting, that's what it was always about. Mm -hmm. Changing who we were. The cookie to, cutter. <laughs> yeah. To be like this rubber stamp, whoever yeah. had the stamp. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it's not like that at all. I've learned to appreciate everybody's differences and am learning. I'm not there <laughs> yet, but it's wonderful. I mean, it, it's, it's like looking out at a rainbow and the, the different colors and trees and flowers. And if we could learn to just appreciate who each person is, it would be so much more enjoyable. Absolutely. What does our time look like? I don't mean to interrupt. Go on. We still got about 10 minutes. Good. Because uh, I want to not change the subject, but just kind of throw out a, what I think is a good example uh, of the subject. Uh, 
Mm, about you, but well, I do know you've expressed to me. It's been a wonderful weekend, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, even though we had to try, we've traveled 700 miles in the past two days. Uh, it was a quick round trip, but uh, we went to a family reunion. And uh, these days, I'll, I'll admit, I'll be honest, I go with an agenda. You know, I have uh, something in mind, and it's it's a good thing. It's just I want to communicate. I, I want to get people involved at this table, this table of discussion. Open up. Give me your thoughts. And uh, uh, I had a number of opportunities. And I had one of the greatest compliments, if not the greatest compliment, that, uh, has ever, that I feel like has ever been paid toward our children. And uh, I, I want to share this. Because, uh, you know, you hear testimonies all the time about this or that or the other. But to me, this is a wonderful testimony. My sister uh, came to me and she said that her daughter told her that, said, Mom, you're different when you're around family. And when she told me that, I said, oh, really? I said, how so? And she said, well... She said, you know, and, and she specifically re referenced our kids, our children. And she said, that, I think they like me. They <laughs> like to be around me. And I said, so when you get around them, you get to be yourself? Yeah, yeah. And they seemed to enjoy that. And she said, I don't, I don't sense that from other people. I don't think others like me. And, when she said that, she kind of corrected herself and said, well, you know, maybe they like me, but I said, you can't really be yourself. Well, yeah, yeah. And uh, I thought, wow, that's wonderful. That they can be, that she can be herself around our children. Now, the question is, and the sad thing is, why can't she be herself around others and still be liked? What, is there something wrong with that? You don't think there's something wrong with that? You know, there's something wrong with not being yourself, <laughs> but, you know, there's not something wrong with her wanting to be herself. Well, uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Is there something wrong with not being able, having to be someone else for people to like you? Mm -hmm. You know, why, where does that come from? Where does that kind of thinking come from? Uh, I like to think of it as uh, Dr. Jones, one of his old expressions, that's some of that stinking thinking. <laughs> and the problem is, you know, I think the term unconditional love is used a lot. You hear it a lot. You know, God loves us unconditionally. Uh, but then when, when the rubber meets the road, uh, it seems as though he really can't stand us. And he wants to change us so that he can, first of all, tolerate us, let us even come into his presence. And then once we get there, he's going to start working on us and get us just right so that we can spend time with him. And, you know, maybe I was that way one time. And I did. I know that uh, I was guilty. <laughs> you know, a big problem with that? He made us who we are. <laughs> that is a problem. Yeah. 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 And he even made us, designed us, and this is where I like what, uh, what Bob has to say so many times. You know, he made us uniquely the way we are with problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And it's not as if, he, you know, he's saying the problems are okay and you just hang on to them and enjoy them. You know, he, uh, he has help for us. You know, he wants to get us through these problems. But that's where, like you said, you know, we need each other. We've got to learn how to appreciate one another because that's our participation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and it goes back to another thing that Jesus said. And uh, I, I love this because it took me so many years to ever figure out, really. And, and I think I, I will say this much. I think I pretty well got it figured out that when he said or at least in English words, the English terms that we had. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another. So, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm going, yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus, you want me to, you command me to love her? Okay, 
I will then, or I'll sure try. So they make you happy. <laughs> okay, I gotta love you somehow or another. <laughs> what in the world is all that? If that's love, I think, no, nah, I'll pass. Let me try something <laughs> else. But and in reality, what I have for you, you, you can't stop it, you know. I wouldn't change it for anything. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's voluntary. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And that's what I get from you. Um, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, and probably again. Sometimes I'm just overwhelmed by, you know, how can you love me like you do? You know, I don't question it because it's there. You know, I see it every day, day in, day out. I experience it. It's like the little babies that you hold. I watch you love them. And I think, that's so good that she doesn't have to give all that to me because there's enough to go around. <laughs> and I know what that baby's experiencing because it's so sweet. It's so wonderful. And uh, I guess this is where, you know, to my atheist brothers and friends, I say, you know, tell me where else this can be coming from. You know, other than just something divine, <laughs> someone divine, maybe. But to go back to where we started with all this, I have to question these people that, that don't seem to have that. You can't seem to find it in their character at all. It seems like all there is is meanness and unkindness and just the antithesis of love. Could it be that no one's ever taken them? in their arms and expressed it to them. Kind of like what Jesus talked about. He wasn't giving a command, love your enemies or else, you know. He was saying, learn this. Find this in yourselves. It's there. And once you do it, you're going to see change. People that have never experienced love, they don't even know what it is until they experience it. Someone's got to bring it to them. But it's there. It's in them. I'm convinced of that. You're looking at your watch. I'm just saying. Okay. I'm turning on my watch. Ah, okay. So I think we've kind of gone full circle here with an idea. And that was kind of my intention. But um, let's uh, talk for the next three minutes about our experience. Uh, we We had what? Just a handful of hours with our, uh, you getting a message there? Okay. With our family members. And uh, as I've already stated, I had an agenda. But I guess the main thing that I'd like to say about it is I've had an agenda for a number of years now. Every time that we've gotten together for a reunion, it's been my goal to, to express this love that we have. And it's almost like an experiment, only, of course, it's way beyond that. You know, it's real. But I want to see what it'll do. And it seems like there's a trend, and I was talking to Nicole about this this morning. It seems like there's a trend uh, in our society away from this sort of thing. We have less time for this. We have less reason to get together as families and for any reason. And and you find finding people that even have family reunions anymore per se is getting more and more difficult. And the ones that do, the numbers are getting smaller and so forth. And I think we had more <laughs> at this one than, than we've had possibly ever. Everybody seems like wanted to be there. And as far as I could tell, everyone enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And I was given, <laughs> I, I still kind of have the reputation as preacher or whatever, <laughs> which is fine. Sometimes it comes in handy. <laughs> but uh, I was called upon to ask the blessing or the food. So it was just an opportunity to express my innermost thoughts. And I made the statement, and I want to make this statement here because my statement went like this. I counted count myself privileged and so thankful to be a part of this group. And I said it toward my family. You know, it was all family members there. 
Uh, with the exception of a couple, it was, you know, it's kind of like uh, back in the days of Judaism, you know, when the strangers would come <laughs> in and <laughs> be a part. But anyway, the, the truth is, I count myself privileged to be a part of that group. But I can use that term in a broader sense, and no one even has to realize that's what I'm doing, because I'm just thankful to be a part of the New Covenant group which as far as I'm concerned, is a group that is global. <laughs> it's a global community. And I have brothers and sisters in, that are members of this group in all parts of the world, every corner of the world. Diverse group. And you talk about the diversity that's in the body of Christ. Uh, I don't know anything about that yet because there's so many that I haven't been involved with yet. But uh, we have such a wonderful road ahead of us as far as I'm concerned, discovering as much as we can in this area, how far can we take this thing called relationships? And uh, I, I keep saying the sky's the limit. <laughs> well, we keep moving forward and we're gonna find out little by little. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I think so. And uh, there's no reason why we can't enjoy the journey. I certainly am. What about you? I am. Is there time up? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I've enjoyed it. You want to close for us? I'll give you that privilege. <laughs> well, I have enjoyed it. and I, We hope that y'all have also. And we thank you for joining us. And uh, stay tuned. There's much more to come. And uh, we can all enjoy them also. Absolutely. Thank you.